Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for thanks so much for being here. Um, I mean, it's good morning, but shortly it's going to be good afternoon. Um, it's awesome to be in Seattle on such a beautiful day, and also so you know, see so many familiar faces from last year's Open Source Summit in Vancouver. Uh, my name is Mo Hagigi. I'm a distinguished engineer with Discover Financial Services. Um, today we are going to cover a range of topics, but. Basically, the focus is going to be on um, how you can actually get your cloud native journey started with open source tools, frameworks, and technologies in a way that basically you make that journey um, a, a seamless one for your developers and engineers. Um, first, we're going to start with cloud native and microservices, then we go into the orchestration phase, a little bit on the containerized microservices and how and what sort of challenges we're going to basically face um, a little bit on Helm um, operators. It's going to be next, basically. I'm, I'm going to offer operators as an alternative to Helm charts and how that's going to help your engineers to actually become more innovative and use their time to actually code and be creative rather than um, uh, just focus on um, you know, putting configurations into their clusters. And then later, I'll talk about um, OpenShift as an alternative um, to bare metal Kubernetes. And then observability is going to be the last one, just to give you an idea of uh, you know, how you can actually get your uh, platform up and running and then have a good observability around it uh, to make sure your applications and platform uh, are healthy. Um, here's a quick snapshot of my journey in the tech industry. Um, it's been filled with challenges and obviously um, learning opportunities. Um, but I'm grateful for all the you know, diverse roles and uh, organizations that have shaped my career. So in 2007, I worked for Sun Microsystems as an intern to build and promote open source uh, technologies, mainly with Java programming languages and um, JVM languages, NetBeans, Tomcat, Glassfish, open source, etc. So I think Sun basically realized the true power of open source uh, in the industry before um, and, and made a significant contribution uh, before other major players basically caught on. Um, at Sun, I had the opportunity to program a small sensor um, devices, which we call IoT today, Internet of Things, with Java. And then, um, you know, I basically managed to tinker with all the telecommunication properties in them. And that basically inspired me so much that I carried on, um, you know, my academic journey into doing a PhD and a couple of postdocs after that. Then I joined IBM, um, which was at Intel, um, to basically try to embed machine learning into smart objects and also have all those cloud services connected to them. Uh, that was actually quite interesting because we managed to get into a lot of a smart city and smart healthcare applications. And later I joined IBM and I led uh, developer advocacy in Europe, Middle East and Africa and hybrid cloud built team. And right now I'm, uh, I'm at Discover. I'm leveraging my tech expertise to drive innovation in the financial sector, which basically takes a very long time because of all the compliance and security and so many other issues around um, you know, your tech um, stack. So what is cloud native? Um, cloud native refers to how an application is built rather than where the application resides. And that basically means your applications must be built, um, delivered, and operated in a way that they're not hardwired to any infrastructure. That's a very important point. So you are basically just focusing on how your application is built rather than where your application is going to reside. And cloud native basically refers to a set of principles, practices, technologies, and tools um, that leverage cl cloud computing re resources and services to design, build, manage, and deploy applications in scalable, resilient, and agile manner. That's basically the best definition we can give to cloud native. So not only it refers to how an application is built, but also it provides a set of principal practices and technologies together with the tool chain around them. So, for example, cloud native approaches emphasizes the use of um, microservices architecture, containerization, DevOps practices, CI, CD, and infrastructure as code. And that's basically, um, and other cloud native tools and platforms to enable rapid innovation, flexibility, and efficiency. Those are very important points that I'm going to get to and how we are basically going to deliver those three important and significant qualities to our engineering workforce by following the right cloud, cloud native principles and practices. 
But what is Moksha Services architecture? Where does it fit? So Moksha Services architecture is the building block and the most essential ingredient of cloud native applications. In its core, it basically um, promotes uh, partitioning large monolithic applications into smaller um, services and all those smaller services are going to be communicating with HTTP and messages. That's basically the most essential part of microservices architecture. And your services must become highly maintainable and um, um, loosely coupled and also independently deployable. So you've got to have the maintainability, deployability, and all those things are completely um, uh, decoupled basically from your infrastructure and the other services. And then obviously all those smaller pieces are need, they need to be around business functionality. So once you have that, then you can actually call your application a microservices architecture. Let's take a look at this microservices architecture, this monolithic application, which is basically an online shop. We've got our inventory service, billing, um, catalog services, and recommendation, all of them all together basically bundled as one monolithic application. There is little flexibility on what we can actually do with these services. If something happens, it's going to basically um, cause failure in the entire application. But if we actually make those services decoupled and you know, highly maintainable, then uh, around business functionalities, then we can actually break them down. So the billing service is going to be completely separated, the inventory service separated, your catalog services separated. Everything is going to become completely um, independent and loosely coupled. And once we have that, then we can actually say that's a microservices architecture. Just one uh, advantage of that, if you, for instance, look at you know, what's happening during Christmas holidays where um, the traffic is actually quite high on uh, online shops, you can see the catalog services are always busy. But it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's going to go through the payment and billing. And you just basically need to scale your catalog service, not the other ones, because not everybody's going to go through their basket and make a payment. And that basically makes it possible for you now to just scale your catalog service, not the rest of them. Whereas in the past, if I wanted to scale my application, I had to scale the entire um, you know, monolithic application, which was mostly, you know, most cases, in a, as a VM. So that gives you a lot of flexibility once you have your application broken down into microservices. But then you might ask, how does this modular design enable organizations to innovate, develop, deploy, and scale more efficiently? That efficiency that I mentioned earlier. Um, when we look at these four um, terms here, um, you know, in terms of you know, being, they becoming more efficient, we can actually look at it this way. Let's take a look at our monolithic application again. So we've got all the services bundled together. And then we basically break them down into microservices based on their functionalities. And this way, we can easily um, develop them using different frameworks, programming languages, or databases. In the past, that wasn't quite possible. You had to stick to one single programming language or one database. Nowadays, you can easily just break them down and even distribute them across multiple clouds. So once we do that, we get a number of advantages out of them. First of all, Services can evolve on different timelines. That's an important one for agility. When you have um, a team, um, you know, multiple teams working on different features, they can easily independently work without relying on each other. Whereas in the past, that wasn't possible. The next one, they can be deployed separately. So they don't need to wait for each other to finish one work in a waterfall manner or anything like that. And they can easily just like deploy their applications, their services, without waiting for the other teams to finish their parts. And that gives them a lot of agility. The other one, you can choose your technology stack based on what I said earlier in the previous slide, according to what best basically fits the purpose. You don't have to stick to a single programming language because the other services are written in that programming language or a single database or a single uh, framework. And that has given a lot of flexibility to companies. And again, from the workforce perspective and the talent acquisition, that gives you a, a lot of flexibility. But also it comes with a lot of challenges, which we're going to get to them later. And then last in this one, actually, is scaling your individual microservices, as I said earlier. So you don't have to scale the entire application. So your cloud bills are going to go lower. That's, that's one of the biggest advantages. But the most important when it comes to the overall picture when you look at microservices architecture, if one 
Microsoft service fails, it doesn't necessarily mean that the entire application is going to fail. In the past, if your billing service failed, your entire application would have become completely um, unusable. And that's basically, that happened to a lot of online shops. Um, and you couldn't actually have your catalog service up and running. You couldn't easily, you know, basically replace or kind of, you know, fail over to another service running somewhere else because you, could, you didn't even know where that problem resides. You had to actually have the entire team there focusing on finding the problem and trying to actually trace the issue. But then this becomes quite important. One, one or two or three, doesn't matter. How many microservices are going to go down? It doesn't necessarily make the entire application unusable. So now let's go back to this. So we've basically broken down our monolithic applications into microservices. And now we are going to containerize each one of those microservices with their dependencies and libraries. This way, you can easily just run any one of these containers on any cloud, on any environment. And that gives you that sort of multi-cloud or hybrid cloud even capability right there. But again, we need more um, sort of capability. It's not just about five microservices, as I put here. Like some of the financial services applications, you basically end up with more than 250 microservices. And again, I'm talking about medium-sized applications. So let's remind uh, ourselves about the sort of problems that you get out of monolithic applications. So we talked about all the advantages we get out you know, from microservices architecture, but the monolithic applications, um, you know, the first one was the one that I mentioned in the last slide. You know, obviously you, you've got this sort of um, capability to keep your other microservices going, whereas in the monolithic applications you didn't have that. Errors are quite hard to trace. And then um, making updates and maintaining uh, maintenance becomes quite easier for you. Whereas with monolithic applications, that wasn't the case. Every time you wanted to maintain or update something, you had to bring down your entire application, make the, make the updates, add the feature, and then um, make them back up again. And then agility, um, that was a point that I made earlier. Um, the teams had to rely on each other, they had to wait on each other, and that was actually a big problem in the past. Whereas now, we don't have that. And obviously, there was always this sort of um, battle between the operation engineers and, and developers. Every time something happened, they had to actually kind of blame each other, and they, they didn't actually realize who was to blame. And it's much easier now, even though they're still fighting, but it's much easier now through the DevOps team to actually figure out where the problem resides. So, okay, we've done those, you know, kind of we've broken down our, our, our application into microservices, we've containerized them. Okay, now we've got a, a fantastic cloud native. No, that's not the case. So what's next? Next is about orchestration. So we need to be able to orchestrate all those microservices. If you're going to have 100 microservices, we are not going to be able to manually um, basically orchestrate them or kind of manually uh, scale them. Um, so we need to have an orchestrator to do that job for us. And the orchestration is done through Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is an open source platform for automating deployment, scaling, management, and, um, and basically management of containers applications. That's what Kubernetes offers. And when you look at it, um, you know, in terms of the, the sort of advantages you get out of Kubernetes, a multi-container application must run on a multi-host environment in order to eliminate that single point of failure. So if one host went down, our orchestration tool can easily switch the load to another host. And that was actually the same example that I gave earlier about an online shop during Christmas period. And then when it comes to scaling our application, we need to be able to create new instances of our individual microservices containers to scale accordingly. And that needs to happen automatically. And that's basically what Kubernetes is going to offer us. So the next one, when one or more of our services need to be updated, or let's say we are adding a new feature to our mix. Then the orchestration platform must be able to automatically schedule new deployment and create new instances of our containers with zero downtime. It does it in a way that it basically tries to do this sort of green, blue-green deployment or canary deployment. It can easily just program our Kubernetes uh, platform to do that for us. And then Kubernetes scales, scales and manages our containers according to the available underlying resources. If we don't have that, then obviously we don't know exactly how we are going to scale up or down because if these resources are not going to be available, then the system is going to fail. So Kubernetes basically does that based on the availability of our resources. And then last one is um, in case of any failure, Kubernetes needs to check our containers continually to make sure they're healthy. 
And if there are failures, it will take actions to reinstate or deploy or create new instances or restore the services. And all that is going to happen, all those features that I just mentioned, Kubernetes will basically do them automatically. But the way it does it, it basically happens in a way that we declare what we, we, we want Kubernetes to do. And then Kubernetes will reconcile to make sure that that will happen. But those features I mentioned, they have a full focus on a scaling and failover, if you've noticed. It's all about the scaling and failover. And the way it basically happens is um, Kubernetes is portable and extensible for managing using declar declarative configuration and automation. And that's an important point here because the rest of my presentation is going to focus on this. We basically say what we desire from the platform and Kubernetes will keep watching our containers to make sure that the actual state matches the observed, the, the desired state. So that needs to happen and it will basically keep you know, going through that loop, that reconciliation to make sure that is actually going to be the case. So they need to match. So Kubernetes will keep on working until uh, the, the, you know, both states are going to be exactly identical. And that's a very important concept here because the rest of the presentation, when I get to the operators, you're going to see how Kubernetes is going to handle what we desire in terms of the configuration in the clusters. So we've got our containers. Let's take a look at what actually happens when we um, uh, deploy it into Kubernetes and what Kubernetes is going to do. So um, deploying each Docker container with Kubernetes will spin up a pod with this Docker container in there. And then based on our deployment scenario, what we declared, what we desire um, in that YAML file that I will show you later, um, Kubernetes will load each pod and basically replicate them. Uh, in terms of the number of instances we require. And then that's basically the first step that we create a deployment. And then we need to scale our deployment accordingly. As I said, we can actually define how many instances we require Kubernetes to create for us for each one of those services. And then Kubernetes will basically create those as replicas. And the next step is to create a service which allows our applications to, um, our microservices to communicate with each other within the cluster. And then the next step, you know, which is this one basically, it shows how they can communicate. And the next step is to expose our application to the internet and the external network. And that happens um, automatically once we have all the applications running and the networking between them is completely established. So, the stages that I've just described right now, is about 12 commands in Kubernetes. And that's quite simple. You containerize your application, and then you make a deployment, create replicas, and then expose your services. Here are those, those commands, basically. So you create a deployment, and then expose that, and then you can even scale and even roll back if you want to go back to the previous version of your application. Quite simple. Um, and if you want to do it like in a batch operation, and again, that's important because I'm going to get to that, how you can actually automate even this one. You just basically use the YAML file and you define exactly what you desire about your application. So in your YAML file, it says replicas. If you want three for that, um, you know, my app, um, that would basically just go for the version one and make sure all the time there are going to be, there's going to be like three instances of that application up and running. Under the hood, what would happen? What does Kubernetes do? So as a developer, we use kube control, kube cuttle, kube CTL, whatever we call that. We basically use that magic word to interact with the Kubernetes cluster. And then Kubernetes basically lets us to, you know, create a cluster and its resources. And then um, if we go back to our deployment scenario, uh, we instruct our master node to create a deployment based on the given container. And then master node basically processes our request through this API server and then runs a, sh a scheduler service that automates when and where those containers are going to be deployed um, based on our, de de again, declaration. And then each worker node basically includes a Docker and a software agent called Kubelet that receives and executes order from the master node. That's the next step. And then Kubelet basically spins up a new pod um, for every instance of our container, and then it exposes our application to the external board. That's exactly what happens under the hood in Kubernetes. Again, quite simple, and all of these are basically API-based. You can easily extend them, you can access them directly, uh, so you've got basically full control. And again, when I say you can extend them and access them, that's a very important concept, as I will get to that later for the operators. 
So we've got the full picture now, uh, how basically Kubernetes is going to orchestrate our containers. But when it comes to Kubernetes, there are different flavors of Kubernetes from different hyperscalers. It completely differs from one platform to another, and almost every major cloud provider basically offers a different flavor of Kubernetes. So you get, you've got different sets of add-on, set of instructions for um, connecting your application to the other services from that cloud uh, provider. And again, in most cases, you can't actually use the same instructions uh, with another cloud provider. That's actually a problem. And I'm just basically um, listing four of them. Google Cloud, um, Azure, and AWS, and IBM Cloud. Those are the four services. There are more than 16, 17 major Kubernetes services available right now, and they're quite competitive. So that basically gives us a number of challenges. Um, as I said, Kubernetes takes care of orchestration, but what about the other mechanisms? Um, all those benefits that I mentioned earlier, um, such as consistency across environments, lightweight deployment, and efficient resource utilization, um, those are all great, but again, there are negative parts as well. Um, those certain complexities that you can see here, those are the ones that often developers have to deal with them, and they're quite hard to actually manage and navigate. So the learning curve uh, is basically new concepts and terminologies when you're dealing with Kubernetes orchestration. Developers need to familiarize themselves with new concepts, terminologies, and technologies associated with each cloud platform. Um, when it comes to interaction with CI-CD, developers need to integrate containerization with CI-CD pop pipeline and automation frameworks. And again, different companies, the way they've design their development workflows to automate and streamline is completely different. So that takes a huge amount of training basically for your engineers if you want to have that um, in your company. And then when it comes to container networking, developers need to understand um, you know, how networking basically works between different containers and the service discovery, load balancing, ingress, egress, all those things are quite complex. So as I said, for a simple deployment, Kubernetes takes care of everything, but when it comes to scaling your applications as having that network up and running, those are the complex issues that we're going to face. But the most important one that makes Kubernetes quite difficult to maintain in, in the way that it basically comes as a bare metal of Kubernetes is actually the security and compliance. And that's why so many companies out there, they kind of um, customize um, Kubernetes to an extreme um, extent, and that makes it quite different to the bare metal Kubernetes that developers are going to learn how to deal with it. Um, so developers obviously need to implement, configure, and manage security compliance, access control, encryption, authentication, and authorization mechanism to protect those containerized applications. But at the same time, you need to make sure that all those containerized um, applications, microservices, are, um, they're not basically vulnerable against attacks and breaches. And that's actually quite important because when it comes to another layer on top of that, it creates a lot of complexity. But those are the challenges. And some of these challenges, you can easily um, overcome those by just having a proper configuration into your cluster and your namespaces. And that usually happens by um, you know, taking advantage of Helm charts. Um, so Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. It basically allows developers and operation engineers to easily package, install, configure, and deploy applications. So all those configurations that are required for, the, you know, for those complexities, you can actually package them in Helm and then put it into your cluster. That could actually solve the problem to some extent. But then it becomes quite difficult as we go forward. It's not just for the day one operation, it's for day two operation. So Helm charts, if you're asking what they are, they're just simply um, you know, YAML, Kubernetes YAML manifest combined into a single package that can be advertised to your Kubernetes cluster. That's all it does. So that YAML file that I showed you earlier with batch operation that I mentioned, that's exactly the same thing. So Helm basically is going to make sure all those configurations are going to be packaged and put into your cluster with ex and make sure that all those desired states are going to be right there in your cluster. Um, and you know, when it comes to Helm charts, basically Helm um, uses a packaging format called charts, and a chart is just a collection of those files. So it makes it a bit more complex because then you have a collection of files that describe a set of Kubernetes resources, and they're all kind of, you know, um, in a hierarchical manner in most cases. But the most important aspect here is 
Once you have those Helm charts deployed to your cluster, you can be sure that all those observation and reconciliation is going to happen. Kubernetes is going to make sure that it's going to keep your actual state and the desired state exactly the same. So let's say you have defined a security measure, and you can actually um, apply that security measure using Helm charts, and it will definitely happen exactly according to your expectations, or if you, are, if you want a database up and running uh, or behave in a way that you desire. But then, um, you know, Helm basically takes that templates YAML and value files and merge them, you know, before deploying the merge YAML into a cluster. And that's important here because once you have that, then it makes it difficult for you for your day two operation. Because, um, you know, those are, there are cases where you want to actually add complexity of your applications into your YAML files and Helm doesn't allow you to do that. You need to actually code it in. And, and since you can't actually do that, it, it basically offers a number of challenges here because um, you know upgrades are going to be hard. The persistent is not going to be supported through that. Errors are again hard to trace. So those are the sort of problems that you're going to encounter. That's why Helm um, primary focus is on day one operation for deploying Kubernetes um, artif ar ar um, uh, artifacts in, in a cluster. So the solution to that is to take advantage of all these amazing APIs in Kubernetes. And, and to do that, you basically take advantage of operators. Operator is a powerful concept that enables you to um, automate the management of complex stateful applications on Kubernetes. And the main benefit of Kubernetes operators are automation and standardization. With operators, you can automate deployment management of complex applications. So you can easily code in the logic of your applications into operators. Um, it gives you a number of advantages. Um, as you can see, like, you know, updating your applications, constant health check of your um, microservices. And again, you can actually encapsulate the knowledge of your applications into your cluster natively. So instead of asking your developers to go through all those Helm charts, like 70 Helm charts, I've seen in some companies that, you know, developers have to go through 70 different Helm charts basically just to get a simple application up and running. You can easily code in all those knowledge into an operator and just put it into your cluster and everything else is going to happen automatically by just taking advantage of the, you know, extending the APIs of Kubernetes. So for that, you need to define a number of resources. Um, so the, the ones that I mentioned earlier, like de deployment, pod, and services, those are um, um, default resources in Kubernetes. If you want to take advantage of extending those APIs, you need to define custom resources. And your custom resources could be your own messaging APIs, your own security, your own queue. You can basically define it the way you want. And once you have those custom resources, you just need to um, uh, basically define them in CR, these custom resource definitions in a YAML file and then deploy it to your Kubernetes. And that's it. That's all it takes. There is only one minor issue here. So for your custom resources, when I deployed an application or created a pod, there is a controller attached to that. So that controller knows exactly how to deal with a pod or a service or a deployment. Those are the ones that I showed in those commands. But when it comes to your custom resources, obviously you need to have a controller as well. How does it know how to deal with your custom resource definitions, those custom resources that you've just defined? And it could be something simple. Um, but again, you need to actually attach that. You need to have that. And for that, you need to, um, create your own controller as well. And in, in Kubernetes, it's quite easy. You just basically program it in using Go language. And, and again, there are other ways as well. You can use Ansible, you can use Java SDK or Helm. But again, you have to look at it this way. With Go, you can go all the way from installation to autopilot. And with Java as well, you can go to somehow very close to autopilot phase as well. But with Ansible and Helm, you can only get to the first and the second and third to you know, some extent to the third phase. So the life cycle is not even fully manageable using um, Ansible. But those organizations that have created the operators, they made their journey for their developers quite seamless and expedite their journeys basically through application development, mainly for Greenfield. But again, for modernization is actually quite important as well. So, the CRDs, are, they have also another advantage. So let's say you've got four different clusters, um, deployment, testing, staging, and production. In many organizations, once you actually move the application from development to production uh, cluster, things are going to completely go, um, you know, they're going to fail because the, the um, clusters are not identical. So you want to make sure that your CRDs, they have some sort of um, RBACs attached to them that makes sure that if you design an application in development, is going to have the same sort of um, access control in the production as well. 
And that's basically because CRDs can be namespace, they can be cluster scope, and then multi multiple versions of CRDs can exist um, you know, at the same time. Uh, that makes it quite easier for your developers to work in different environments without adding a new set of Helm charts or configurations because the CRDs are set according to the namespace or the cluster they're running in. And they have hierarchical relationships. So some of the CRDs could have full access, some of them they could basically, the child, like, the, the, the child branch could have like limited access, but this way you just basically find it once and everything else is going to be um, injected to your clusters. And then RBAC's um, role-based access control is going to be managed seamlessly as well. So when you look at Helm charts and Kubernetes operators, they both you know, ad, you know, provide ways for admins to deploy applications and configurations into clusters, but operators basically um, they offer this sort of easy to deploy format and they can use custom resources to give you full flexibility to take advantage of Kubernetes APIs. Whereas with Helm, you don't have that. You can just basically put the configurations for day one. The rest of it, it needs to happen using operators for day two operations. And that's, those are like very important um, terminologies and the technologies that I've described because of the problems and challenges that I mentioned about cloud native development and especially Kubernetes. So as a reminder, those are the challenges we uh, visited earlier. And another challenge basically I think um, is the fact that the tool sharing fragmentation is actually quite big. If I want to put all the um, technologies out there, it's gonna like, be at least five or six pages, even if you look at some of the projects on um, CNCF, there are so many amazing products out there, so many amazing projects out there. So this cloud native ecosystem is vast and, and obviously diverse with multitude of tools, frameworks and services. So developers, they're having a hard time selecting this, the, the right set of tools for their specific requirements. And that leads to a lot of complexities as well. The ones that I'm showing right here, they're the ones that I usually tell my mentees that they should actually know and master. If they know this, probably they're gonna get by and they're gonna be okay on their own. Like, um, you know, mastering this um, few ones, you know, takes you from all the way from containerization to visualization of your applications and getting all the telemetry. But there's so many, so many others out there. Like if you look at Istio, if you look at different uh, type of databases, but those are the ones that I think can easily get you, um, in, you know, through your journey without any problem. And that's fully open source, basically. But again, Terraform was amazing, but now we have OpenTofu, which is awesome. We've got so many other things that are being added, uh, you know, through LF and, um, CNCF, which is great. So let's go back to our um, uh, deployment on different um, Kubernetes services on uh, different cloud platforms. That gives you a lot of headaches. As I said, they have their own set of add-ons and um, uh, databases and so many tools that you need to actually get to know. If you go with OpenShift, you don't have that problem. The sort of experience you have with OpenShift on Azure, you know, um, AWS, GCP, uh, is going to be exactly the same. OpenShift is basically built on top of Kubernetes and brings along all the amazing features of Kubernetes. But it bundles Kubernetes with all the essential features that are not available in Kubernetes. And those are basically through a number of automated workflows. Those automated for workflows basically gives you a number of advantages. One is the pre-created um, quick start application, so your developers don't need to actually go through uh, kind of, you know, uh, getting it started guys or anything like that. They've got files, um, you know, in Java, Python, databases, they can easily get it started immediately. And the second one is all they need to do is point their cluster to their Git and to their, basically to the program and, their, and um, OpenShift basically takes care of the rest. And the other thing is you can easily uh, build your application and deploy it locally using um, CodeReady containers. So there's a version of OpenShift available. And then I mentioned that all you need to do is just point your application to your, um, uh, to point your um, cluster to your application in your rep um, Git repo. That's what it happens basically. Um, as a developer, you just push your code and the rest of it, you know, for building an image using S2I source to image, it will happen automatically by OpenShift. And we basically create your container and then deploy it for you and gives you even a URL that you can access your application immediately. In Kubernetes, as I mentioned earlier, you have to go through 12 different steps to make that happen. OpenShift basically takes care of the entire journey for you. And the important aspect of Kubernetes, um, I usually basically talk about the developer productivity, but these are also important. One is the web console, 
With, uh, with OpenShift, basically, you get this amazing web console in admin or application perspective. You can easily see what's happening to your application with this really good um, graphical user interface. Whereas with Kubernetes, you have to deal with command line interface. Again, different um, service providers have included their own GUI, but um, with OpenShift, you get the exact same web console on Azure, on GCP, on AWS, on IBM Cloud. It's exactly the same. So your experience, the experience for your developers is exactly the same. Um, and that's basically uh, what it offers. Um, it's the same sort of experience. And then when it comes to dev spaces, like you can easily create a dev space or a, um, let's say a workspace. It used to be called um, quarterly workspaces. Now it's called dev spaces. You create your own uh, developer space and then you can share it with anyone you like and they can easily start coding in, in a browser. They don't even need to run anything on their computer. You can easily start coding into a browser. And that's the power of uh, quarterly workspaces or dev spaces. And at the end of the day, if you want to just use um, bare metal Kubernetes, you have to remember um, Kubernetes is a production grade open source project, whereas OpenShift is a production grade open source based product. It comes with a huge amount of support from Red Hat, whereas with Kubernetes, you don't actually get that. And you know, with Kubernetes, you basically get an engine and you, you can't actually get from A to B, whereas with OpenShift, you've got everything. You've got the full bundle to take you um, to your journey. And then um, the last one is observability, but I think I haven't got enough time. But again, no matter how good you've designed your application and how you run it, but bugs can still occur. And even if you've tested your code, again, the most important layer of maintaining quality, there's, there's a chance of you know, having errors and bugs. And for that, you actually need to have a proper observability in place. And there are four golden uh, signals for you um, to understand exactly how your application is doing. You can look at latency, traffic, saturation, and error rates. Those are the most important ones. And, and then that gives you, um, to achieve observability, then you must generate specific data. And for that, you need logs, metrics, and traces. And those are the differences, basically, between them. Um, I'm getting to the end of my talk. I'm going to go through them very quickly. But there's a massive difference between observability and monitoring. Obviously, with observability, you're looking at logs, metrics, and traces. Whereas with observability, you look at those four golden signals that I mentioned earlier. And the combination of both give you a full insight into your application. There are multiple approaches for that in Kubernetes. Um, you can see them, um, obviously, agent-based observability, the metrics API, and then agent-based Kubernetes observability with eBPF. Um, those are quite effective and gives you full insight into your applications. Again, um, I wish I could go into more details, but the way they collect data and logs, they basically differ in so many ways. Um, and then um, you, you need to definitely make sure that, you know, in terms of best practices, you define your metrics, automate your monitoring, and you integrate it well with your CI CD. And for that, the amazing tools available out there, Prometheus, Grafana, and Datadog, those are the ones that have worked out very well. Um, obviously, with Prometheus and Grafana, you've got this amazing sort of open source ecosystem and, and a great um, ecosystem to get advantage of, uh, take advantage of the other tools that have been built on top of this. And with Datadog, obviously, you've got the commercial version as well, um, which gives you full monitoring um, as a you know, uh, full um, suite. Um, with that, um, a quick point, um, all, this, all the points that I mentioned here, I've got this full tutorial that I built back in the, during the pandemic um, years. Um, so I basically wanted to display COVID-19 data on a display at home. So I basically built this um, monolithic application that you know, uh, pulled data from a GitHub repository of Johns Hopkins University. And then um, I ran a few parcels that shows me exactly, showed me exactly what's the number of mortality and also infections in different parts of the world. And that basically gives me a lot of advantages to break it down and turn it into a macro services and then add my um, machine learning service to that. So that basically turned into this tutorial on my GitHub is about 200 slides and eight hours of videos on YouTube if you want to uh, take a look. You can actually go through the entire journey from containerization from microservices all the way to Tekton and creating your CI CD pipeline. So basically, it teaches you everything. That all the things that I mentioned today, you can actually go through that and, and learn them. I basically coded against a green screen. Uh, that was that was actually a good um, experience. With that, uh, thank you so much for attending my talk. I hope it's been useful. And if you've got any questions, we've got a few minutes left.
Yes. Yes, as well. Um, I mean, I cannot talk about Discover, but um, what I can say is GitOps is, again, is another way of coding you know, your entire configuration to your Git and make your Git as a single source of truth, and then inject everything from your Git into your cluster. And again, the best, basically, in my, in my view, the best way you can implement it is to have Terraform or OpenTofu on the bottom to um, provision your infrastructure. And then for your clusters, you can actually use um, GitOps to inject all the configurations into a cluster and applications and then use Ansible and operators on top of that to inject it even further um, to the top. But GitOps, again, together with Argo CD for the um, continuous delivery one, is, is a fantastic solution and I think it's changing the landscape.